The USS Greyback, SSG-574, was the first submarine to fire a nuclear cruise missile. Launched on the 2nd of July 1957, the Greyback was originally designed as an attack submarine, but was adapted to a cruise missile submarine in 1958. At the time of its launch, it was a state-of-the-art vessel, measuring 273 feet or 83 meters in length, with a displacement of 1,740 tons. With its three Fairbanks Morse diesel engines and two Elliott electric motors, it was capable of 15 knots surfaced and 12 knots submerged. In September 1958, she conducted the first successful launch of a cruise missile, the Regulus II, from a submarine. The launch of its predecessor, the Regulus I, in 1955, heralded the capability of submarines to attack land-based targets. The Greyback deployed with four Regulus I missiles. It was mainly tasked with deterrent missions along America's west coast. In 1964, the Regulus I missile program ended and the Greyback was withdrawn from active service. In November 1967, the Greyback's twin missile bays were converted into diving hangars for special forces operations with an amphibious transport submarine. The conversion saw two auxiliary tanks added to the engine room and the boat's length was increased by 12 feet. The missile chambers were converted to a 67 embarked troop carrying compartment with a SEAL swimmer delivery vehicles SDVs capability. A diver's decompression chamber was also added in the starboard hangar. This new capability, unheard of elsewhere in the Navy, had been routine aboard USS Greyback for more than 15 years. On the 16th of January 1982, the Greyback had bottomed in Subic Bay on the west coast of Luzon in the Philippines. At 22.46, the SDV returned to the hangar. At 23.38, the dry side supervisor ordered the opening of the hangar vent valve. The order was acknowledged and obeyed, and no vent pipe alarm was heard. To exit the chamber, it was necessary to drain the water from the wet side. This was to be accomplished by an operator in the control bubble, a plexiglass enclosure from which he was to open the valve to allow air into the chamber as the water drained out. After reporting the valve open, the operator opened the drain valve to drain the water from the hangar. The drain down commenced, and at around 23.40, some divers reported feeling dizzy, and the chief checked the hangar vent. 23.42 saw the chief hooking an arm through a pipe to prevent drowning as all of the divers passed out. At 23.44, dry side rescue attempts commenced via BMC with tap signals. There was no response. At 23.50, there were dry side attempts to operate the vent. At 2400 hours, the dry side supervisor entered through the wet side and tragically five bodies were discovered. It was later found that the five U.S. Navy divers died of vacuum-induced bends when a vacuum was inadvertently drawn in the chamber and a vacuum condition occurred as the chamber was draining. Another view is that low pressure caused the divers to lose consciousness and death was in fact through drowning. It is understood that the accident was caused by a series of flaws, including inadequate design and installation, inadequate maintenance procedures, inadequate training, a complacent attitude, inadequate communications, acceptance of abnormal conditions, and a slow response to casualties. The divers' deaths were also attributed to the negligence of General Dynamics Corporation in the conversion from a missile-carrying submarine to a personnel-carrying submarine. Following the accident, the United States Navy conducted an investigation which found four specific design deficiencies with respect to the starboard hangar diving system. The report found that there was a lack of a safety interlock mechanism to prevent the opening of the hangar drain valve when the main vent valve was not fully opened. The only valve position indicator on the main vent valve consisted of a metal tab which is underwater and cannot be seen when draining the hangar. 
there was no remote position indicator visible from the dry side of the hangar. The general design of the hangar made proper maintenance of the main vent valve extremely difficult, if not impossible. It was also found that the Navy was negligent in failing to provide for basic safety features in its COR, which would prevent a partial vacuum or low pressure from occurring, failure to perform sufficient operational testing, failure to conduct a formal design review of the system, failure to properly lubricate and maintain the shaft of the main hangar vent valve. A subsequent court case attributed 80% of the fault to General Dynamics and 20% to the Navy. The accident led to changes in how the Navy designed, built, maintained and operated complex submarine-based diving systems. Both the chronology and the list of legal investigation findings point out a number of small errors. Each one by itself wasn't catastrophic, but when combined in the right order led to tragedy. A questioning attitude or a determination to do the right thing at any of these steps might have broken the deadly chain and averted the mishap. Such a fatal lineup of minor errors would appear to be a very improbable event, yet it happened. The USS Greyback was decommissioned for the second time on the 15th of January 1984 at Subic Bay Naval Station. Just over two years later, the Greyback was sunk as a target in the South China Sea. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it.